Well, hello, welcome to the Crossroads pre-show. My name is Aisha, and we are gonna have an amazing service today. I cannot wait, I'm here with my friend Ryan. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing awesome, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Anything uh, fun happened for you this weekend? We saw, you know what did happen for the first time, this is crazy, I'd never seen it before, was Jesus Christ Superstar. So, I've never seen it either. So watched, so we watched the John Lennon, no, John, the John Legend. <laughs> It was like two years ago on Easter, it came out, you know, and I had never seen it. And it kind of, it came out sometime in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. And I had never seen it. And of course, I grew up in a time where, and in a, in a religious culture where I think that was like the devil, like oh, right, Satan. Right. And, Car and then mm -hmm. I watched it, I was like, oh, it's pretty tame. It's actually probably pretty <laughs> accurate. So, but we had a lot of fun. We watched that with some folks. We Very did that on cool. Friday. And uh, so that was good. I, I, I love the, if, if people haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it, but the person, like Herod is Alice Cooper. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which just, I totally thought that was hilarious That's given like awesome. the play on who Alice Cooper, but like the story behind Alice Cooper is really fascinating too, his whole journey of faith. Like he teaches Sunday school at a Baptist church somewhere oh, now. Oh like, my goodness. I think I you can it. Google it. I don't know, but yeah. like. Well, I'm sure if we Google it, we'll get the truth. Well, that, that whole time period of like the <laughs> 70s, 80s were like presenting yourself as like a devil worshiping band was yeah. like super good for your like pocketbooks. <laughs> And like, again, the circles that I were in, like nobody could see through that. It's like, right. just this, you know, but this is kind of funny. But yes, yeah, so we had a good time doing that. How about you guys? I love it. You know, really good time. We, um, I went and saw a movie in the theater, which was Ooh. very exciting because no one is in the theaters right yeah. now. So we had, um, very there were two other people in the whole place. It was awesome. Nice. And you know, now it's so sad. And now I can't even remember. Oh, it was the little things. A, oh, a good yeah. old Denzel. Was it good? Movie. It was very good. Yeah. Um, we right. have our phone company, AT and T. We get HBO with it. Yeah. And it's on HBO, so we, that's like yes. on the list. We got. Well, that's it. what I've been doing. I that was the only movie left. Yeah. <laughs> that I could actually go to the theater because I've been yeah. H, HBOing all the ones. I did go see. Um, I took the kids and we went and saw Wonder Woman. Yes. Too, so now, did in 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 little things? Is this part of this series of movies that Denzel Washington has been producing that deal with racial inequality and justice? Or is this it was a separate? Not, it's not. This okay. Because somebody was telling me yesterday that he's he has like this lineup of like four or five movies that he's been producing nice. and, and and really just helping with the conversation around race. Oh, in America. I cannot and, wait. So no, this sure was just was like a good old fashioned crime mystery. Crime you mystery. know, he's a detective, oh, a fallen cool. detective, and that's nice. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, yeah, we went to Estes yesterday. We just took yeah. a drive. And, Went up there and got some coffee. Went, never been to Kind Coffee. Yep, I love so that place. So a little place. shout out to mm -hmm. Kind Coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, that was fun. We, we did that and just got bundled up and walked around. Was the around. popcorn place open? It's really not worth it I for bought me popcorn. And brought, I brought caramel corn home. I was going to say, it's saying. really not worth it to go to ask this. There's like five. Care. I don't know which popcorn place people go to, but I, I, we went to this one. And Anyone they make that it fresh. sells Fresh caramel corn. Fresh caramel corn. Do you do with peanuts or without peanuts? I don't. We don't do peanuts because we have a peanut allergy in our family. Oh. So I always try to stay away that's from that. That's good. That's yeah. a wise so when, decision. So when I have a Snickers, I have to sneak it up to my room. Like I feel like I'm a hoarder. I'm like, I can't let the kids be around me when I eat my sneak Snickers. the Snickers. Yeah. No, we, yeah. So we did that too, which was fun. No, didn't see any wildlife this time. We, we went mm. in the middle of the day. It's not the right, right time. Right, so. exactly. But I've had the, I've been up at Estes where you just see tons of elk and just all kinds of fun wildlife. So it's, it's amazing. Um, if we had time, I'd tell you an elk story. And the, a mama was mad at me. Oh, I have really? my mama bear sweatshirt on. That was a mama elk really? that was very upset with me that Got I was between too. her and her child. Yes. <laughs> oh, was it like an accidental? Like, why are you so angry? Oh, at me? I was just like, la, la, la. I'm just like a, walking oh, through. Yeah. And then I was like, whoa. Look at that. Whoa. Uh -oh. Look at that. Oh, here she comes. You know, swooping yeah. up my, my kid and running. Yikes. So, and you were traveling a little bit. You did some consulting I and did working some with some education yeah. groups, which is very cool. Thank you. I love it. I get to travel the nation and help other schools become awesome and yeah. amazing and focused on student learning. And I was in Arkansas, which was amazing, actually. Um, it was actually just 10 minutes west of Memphis, so I just kind of drove oh, over a bridge, and then I yeah. was in Arkansas. Um, but it was fascinating. Um, it was 100% free and reduced uh, meal school, 
and they were joyful and happy and yeah, love life because for them it was just all about being in school. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes we can take it for granted when it's just offered up, but when you're in that kind of a impoverished community, school is yeah. as a refuge. What good peacemaking work. Yes, that you're doing. it's That's amazing. Fantastic. I love it. Well, speaking of peacemaking, uh, we are going to have an amazing worship experience today. I can't wait. We'll be back in one minute. Sam Macho. This is Carson Wentz. Brandon Cooks. And I'm excited to share my story. Share my story during Football Sunday. Football Sunday 2021. This year has been unlike any other year. For all of us. For all of us. But in the middle of the uncertainty, there's a unique opportunity for us all to experience the faithfulness of God. Because when the ground is shifting and the world is rumbling, God is always inviting us into something that cannot and will not ever be moved. Football Sunday 2021. Release hope. Unlock potential. Be unshaken. Be unshaken. I love that. Well, welcome to the live cast. My name is Aisha. We are so happy that you are here with us. And if you're online with us, um, either on the Crossroads online campus or Facebook or on YouTube, welcome. So happy to see you. Okay, everyone in the room, I want you to find your connect card. Find it. Kind of wave it at me. I want to see those those papers waving. Okay, we're getting there. They're trying. Oh, there we go. We got one. Oh, yeah, it's like a bidding auction. I'm going to see the going once, going twice. I need it. Okay, yeah. So whether you're online or here in person, I need you to fill out two things on that, your name and your email address, because this is the way that we stay in contact with you. We take prayer requests. You know, if you're a first or second time visitor to us, welcome. We are so happy that you're here. Please let us know that you're you're new and let us reach out to you. Also, if you are a regular attendee, please mark that on your Connect card. And perhaps you've moved since since uh, the last time you filled out a Connect card. Please let us know that as well. Know that, I promise, we are not going to sell your information or anything like that. So just share whatever information you'd like to know and then drop it in the kiosk for us. And of course, online, you just submit it. Now, as you saw on the video, next week is Football Sunday. I am so so excited. Football Sunday, be unshaken. And so we're going to have incredible stories, music, and a really inspiring message. Now, you can wear your favorite team gear. That's cool, but just no Buccaneers. I'm kidding. You can wear your favorite team gear, okay? We're going to have a fun celebration planned for two Sunday services. So there's going to be no Thursday in person or live cast on February 4th. Now, we want to invite all of our Thursday attendees to jump in and meet with us on Sunday or catch us on demand any time in the week. And now we're going to hear from our incredible worship team. Let's welcome them. Well, I would also like to say good morning to everyone here in the room. Good morning to everyone watching online. It's good to be together and to connect 
If you're in here, I invite you to stand up. We're going to start with some music. Let's put our hands together. Fill this place with clapping.
Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise. favor just close your eyes with me this morning just pray together lord we are grateful to be together we're grateful to have technology that can connect us for those that are tuning in for those that are here on the campus we're grateful to be together it's we know that there's something powerful that happens when we come together it's a great mystery that you've called us to for our good not yours (laughs) lord today i'm reminded that you are a God who heals, you are a God who redeems and restores. And that many of us come into this time with areas of our lives that feel like there is desperate need of healing and restoration. And and so I just pray that your peace would come and that you would remind us in our very core, deep inside of us, that you are one who restores that you restore finances, that you restore broken relationships, that you restore marriages, that you heal, that you work. And may we find hope in that. That you can restore our broken hearts for relationships that weren't mended. You can restore and you can redeem our broken hearts in the midst of great loss and pain and grief. So be present and open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to know that. Lord, over the next few moments as we gather, some of us brand new to this journey of faith, some of us not sure why we're here, some of us who've been on this journey for a while, may we all come with a heart that is curious for what you are doing in our lives, in our world, in our church. So open our eyes, give us eyes to see and ears to hear how we can 
be present so that we might leave this place and go into our everyday normal lives transformed, loving more like Jesus. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat if you're standing up. Thanks for being here today in the room. Thanks for wearing your masks. Y'all look wonderful in those masks. If you're at home, uh, you can take your mask off. Uh, We only require them for those that are on campus, not online. Uh, But it's totally up to you if you prefer to wear a mask at home. By all means, go ahead. So it's good to see everybody. Um, Vaccinations are happening. That's exciting. Good news taking place there. But uh, hey, listen, lots of good stuff. How many of you like some good news? Anybody want some good news? Anybody? Who doesn't want good news? I just want to make sure you plug your ears and know. So good news. Last week, I shared a little bit about ValFest that was coming up. And we talked about the why behind ValFest, this opportunity uh, to just tell Northern Colorado that you are loved, to create a space where people that are maybe feeling a little isolated can safely drive through and, uh, and just hear you're loved and welcomed. And so that's exciting. So last week, we kind of launched it out there. We put it out there, all these kind of COVID safe ways to volunteer and being a part of it. And we, had about a, we have about 100 opportunities for people to donate their talent. And I think we've filled about half of those in one week. That was awesome. So thank you, everybody. We're about halfway to our Living Valentine goal. We have about 30, 25 or 30 signed up right now to do Living Valentines out in the heat. Uh, so that's really nice of you to stand out there and be, be so warm in the middle of February. But uh, so if you haven't yet signed up, you want to do a Living Valentine, which is kind of a similar idea to the trunk. I uh, would love it if you want to be a part of that as well. And one thing that's exciting about Valfest this year, what I want to highlight before we jump into our Welcome to the Weekend video is we have community partners that are helping put this on. We see this as an opportunity, not just for Crossroads Church, but for everybody who loves Northern Colorado to come and tell families we love you and to offer support and to say, here's ways that our business, our organization can support your family, encourage your family. And so we have the opportunity for organizations, businesses, nonprofits to partner and be a a community partner, which just is absolutely free. You can come and set up a living Valentine and just be present and put a sign up for your organization as people drive through, wave, let them know, hey, we love you. So if you're a part of a business or an organization that would like to do that, you can do that right on the website. Uh, If you are a business or organization, maybe you want to give families in Northern Colorado a coupon, or you want to give them a free pen or a magnet so they know about you, we have a swag partnership where you make a little donation to help create the box that we put all those uh, items in, and you can stick uh, your pens in there. We're anticipating 300 cars to come through, 300 families. So if you want to do that, you can sign up on the website. And then we have two giveaways we're doing. Um, some fun drawings for cars that come through. They register and family drawings and giveaways. And maybe your organization would like to partner and provide uh, one of those giveaways. That would be fun. You can do that on the website. And then we have three partners who are helping us make the boxes, the Valentine boxes, uh, by partnering through a donation and they're putting their logos on it. And we've already got those. Those are exciting. So Ace Hardware here in Loveland is partnering with us. How cool is that? So make sure you stop by Ace Hardware and uh, let them know how much that means. And we're excited to have them there. And uh, we also have um, uh, Brent Realty Group is partnering with us as well. And our third one uh, is Jason Perka, financial advisor here in the community who's partnering with us as well. So we're excited to have all these community members being a part of it. So if you know of a partner that would love to, just everybody's on the recruitment trail now. We want to get as many people here telling families in Northern Colorado that they are loved. All right. So that's what we can do this week. If you haven't yet signed up to volunteer, make sure you do that. Also, all right, so it's time now to turn our attention to someone far more engaging, wise, articulate than I am. Katie Martinez with our Welcome to the Weekend video. Check it out. Welcome to the weekend. It's January, and we're not wasting a minute of that fresh feeling. We're off to the races with a new ministry emphasis. Some of us are being entrepreneurial, and we're all interested in spiritual vitality during this second winter of pandemic life. I'm Katie Martinez, and here's what you need to know. I seriously wondered how much traction we could get for the ambitious goals of Peace is Worth It. In truth, the community is already stretched thin. Businesses, nonprofits, and whole families are struggling to find the time, money, and personal strength to do the things that bring us joy. And yet this church is rising strong by reaching past earthly reality and dipping into God's reservoir of creativity. Peace is Worth It is about harnessing the power of spiritual vitality, volunteer talent, and financial generosity. Time invested in your own spiritual life 
plus talent invested in peacemaking projects and treasure invested to fund the mission produces peace on earth. That's the formula for 2021. So how are we doing one month in? I could tell you about the $169,000 invested so far and how that brings us to 61% of our goal only one month in, but that would be boring. I could talk about Valfest on February 14th and the number of volunteer commitments made, but we live for parking lot parties and we're already good at it. What's news to me is the startup energy around new peacemaking ventures. Our own Karen Bentrot started the Blanket Project and she's mobilizing volunteers to make or donate blankets for people experiencing homelessness. And Greg Pyburn, personal coach with 30 years of experience, is offering a free group training and private sessions for those who are unemployed or underemployed. Visit the webpage and get in on the startup craze. I'll end with this. It's not lost on us that a peacemaker's heart is at the center of it all. This series on listening has helped thousands be soft-hearted and wise during a politically contentious month. This weekend, we have communion together to celebrate and seal the work God has done in our hearts. The time investment you made by listening and applying these messages this month has changed you inside and it's making peace in the world around you. After listen, it's football Sunday, and then we begin the season of Lent with a six-part teaching series and a devotional guide you can use every day. Peace is worth it. It's working, and you're an essential worker. So take care of yourself and the people you love. Hi, good morning. I forgot to introduce myself earlier. If you're tuning in for the first time or if you're a first, second time guest here, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church, and it is wonderful to have all of us tuning in together. And I, I don't say it often enough. You know, we celebrate people when they leave, right? Like we throw parties for some strange reason, like you work with somebody and then they leave and then we tell them how wonderful they were. Like maybe if we would have told them how wonderful they were, they wouldn't have ever left kind of thing. But we don't say that enough around here. Our team of volunteers and staff are great, but Katie Martinez, man. What an incredible leader and uh, just a privilege for us to have her wisdom and insight, incredible writer, speaker, communicator, just a wonderful leader. It's great. When we were kind of coming out here and uh, just kind of trying to figure out where God was bringing us and guiding us, one of the big factors was to just know that I was going to get to lead with Katie because she's just amazing. So we're very, very fortunate. If you're in the room, give Katie a big hand. Good. Was that right? Did I say that right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So listen, are you ready to have some fun today? We're going to have some fun. We're going to explore some topics. We're going to wrap up a series called, uh, called Listen. We're going to have communion. Uh, we're going to explore some wisdom from Scripture, learn how to become a better person to make the world a better place. It feels like a good investment of the next three hours of your life, right? <laughs> There's no football. You're okay. Relax. Everybody relax. Uh, so, hey, uh, listen, we're, we started this series and we're exploring what does it mean to honor the light in another person, that light of the world that lives inside of every person. Uh, I come with the belief that the Christ, that the image of God is teeming throughout the universe, that even the rocks will cry out right? That the, the God is present in all things and we are all created in the divine image. And, and one of the ways in which we can depolarize our world is learn to see people as made in the image of God, regardless of beliefs or structures or religion or race or gender or sexuality, any of those things. And so what does it mean to honor the light in another person, right? We've been in this series for about four weeks and we launched it with this proverb. We call it our anchor verse, which is just a passage of scripture that I just encourage everybody to memorize because it kind of is underneath all that we've talked about in this whole series. And Proverbs 18, 13 says, whoever answers before listening, theirs is folly and shame. So that's the idea. We're learning how to be good listeners like in kindergarten, right? We could all use a little bit of that. Let's face it, right? We've all lost our minds when it comes to listening to one another, right? We're all guilty 
penalty is charged. Raise your hand up nice and high. If you're in the room, if you're at home, give me a nod. If you're out in the atrium, uh, let me know. Like, have you ever had somebody judge you, your actions, something about your life, and you've either said this or you've thought this? Hey, talk to me after you've walked a day in my shoes. Anybody ever thought that? Anybody ever, said, anybody ever had that said to you, like, be honest? Like, you don't have to raise your hand. I know you don't want to admit anything wrong with yourself in church. I would never ask you to do that. But like, we would, like, I've probably done it, right? I've, I've, made, I've passed judgment on people and I've thought thoughts and I've said things like telling them how they should be living their life or whatever it might be. And inside of their mind, they've said, hey, walk a mile in my shoes and then come back and talk to me. And that sentiment comes from this reality, I think in our world, when we look around, is that in our world, we have a shortage of empathy, really understanding what it's like to walk in a person's shoes, and we have an abundance of arrogance, right? A shortage of empathy and an abundance of arrogance that I know best for you, for me. And here's how this plays out, right? Let's just, can we just, I won't tell anybody, all right? So what stays during the life, what happens in the life cast stays in the life cast, all right? So this is our secret. If you're tuning in online, it's our secret. How many of y'all like to gossip? Just a little bit. Anybody? Come on. It's fun. Let's be honest, okay? Can we just, we can't ever heal if we don't I recognize we have an ailment, okay? We love to gossip. And we don't, you know, we, we love to get together with those people we close. We call them safe people, right? You're, this is safe, right? You're not going to judge. And, and we get in and we start to have our conversations about people. And we do, we just, we, you know, people of faith are great at doing this at prayer request time, right? We should be praying for so-and-so because so-and-so says this, Right? But we do this in our world. We gossip. We love to talk about what's going on. And we say things out of our arrogance like, I can't imagine why they would say that. I would never do that. Right? We, we look at people's lives. We think about it. We go, if I had their money, if I had their family, if I had their job, oh, I would, oh, I would be. So if I were in their position, I'd be such a better leader. Like we, we do this. It flows out of our arrogance. We just assume it, right? And, and that's just what we do. It's kind of fun to explore and think, well, I can do it. And what we do is we deride our neighbor, right? We say, oh, I can't believe they would do such as If I had their kind of money, I'd never have that kind of debt. I, if I had that, like, look at how screwed up their kids are. I would never, if I had, if I lived where they lived, if I, uh, we, we say these things and we deride one another, right? Because we don't understand one another. Proverbs puts it this way. Proverbs 11, verse 12, this kind of book in the Old Testament that has all these like wise sayings and things that generally apply if you're of the upper class in, you know, ancient Israelite culture, right? It says, whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding holds their tongue, right? It's really hard to say something in a derisive way, to say something in a negative way about somebody you really understand their circumstances, Right? It's really difficult to do that. When we understand, when we know what's going on, it's pretty easy to hold our tongue. But when we don't, we just want to pass our judgment. And here's why we do that. We pass our judgment because we look and judge people through the rubric of our experiences, not theirs. And we don't know that we do this. We don't recognize it. It's just called, it's called internal bias, right? We just think and we assume everybody has the same upbringings that we had, the same values we had. So I look at your life and I think, well, they've grown up just like I had. They lived life just like me. They have the same values instilled in them just like I had. Their zip code was the same zip code as me. And we don't understand that like your experiences or the other's experiences are totally different. And so rather than judge people by my experiences, right, we ought to start to pause and say, how can we look at a person through the rubric of their experiences? What has happened in their life? Because that's what Jesus did. Could you imagine, for those of you that are familiar with Jesus, the person, maybe you've been around faith, you've you've studied his life a little bit, you know that Jesus didn't judge people through the rubric of his experience, right? Jesus didn't look at someone and say, oh, you know what? You should do X, Y, and Z because I'm this close to the Father. You should, why are you not? Right? That's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, well, I'm kind of fully divine and fully human. And why isn't everybody acting like me? Why did, no, Jesus interacted with people because he understood they had experiences. They had their own stories. And Jesus understood that reality so well that he could just exude love in ways that will, it's so hard for us to understand. There's one great story of this, an example in Jesus's life where he just exudes this, like what we'll call empathy, right? 
And in, in the Gospel of Luke, if you're new to Bible study, I'm so, so glad you're with us today. Luke is a, a writing that's found in the Bible. The Bible is a collection of writings, uh, 66 actually, to be specific, that church leaders uh, early on in the history of Christianity said, these, these writings are unique. They're unique. And we, we hold these in a, in a sense of sacredness. And they put them together, and so we have them, and they were written over the course of a, of a very long time, probably a thousand years, you know, maybe give or take a few hundred, but this, this time period where they were actually written, they cover thousands of years. Um, and, and I tend to think of the Bible as three things when I come to it, that the Bible is uh, diverse. It's diverse. It's written by different people, different times for different reasons, very diverse. Uh, the Bible's ambiguous. The Bible isn't as clear as we think it is, as we want it to be. If, if the Bible's so clear, if we could just say, well, the Bible says, and everything be all right, we wouldn't have like a thousand different Christian denominations, okay? So there is some ambiguity in Scripture uh, in these different writings. And the Bible is, 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 is ancient, meaning it comes from a time very different than ours. And when we bring those realities, it's just what it is, to how we interpret and look at Scripture, the world can open up for us and we can see it as a book of wisdom that offers us opportunities to explore how do we be faithful to love, how do we be faithful to care of what God cares about in our day and our time. So if you're kind of afraid of the Bible because you came from an experience that maybe used it to control or manipulate, I hope that you won't find that here. I hope that you'll find us to be a group of people that we open up the Bible and we find in it freedom, we find in it joy, we find in it opportunities to explore how we all misunderstand God and how God reveals God's self perfectly in this person of Jesus. So we get this story in Luke, which is one of the gospels, these four gospels that tell the story of Jesus from different diverse perspectives. And it says in Luke chapter seven, verses 36 through 50, that a Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him. And he entered into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, a Pharisee was a religious leader. You might think of the Pharisees uh, as a pastor, you know, or maybe a bishop, something like that. But we also should remember that Pharisees were a political party as well. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you've heard those two terms, they were kind of like the Republicans and the Democrats of their day. They had different ideas about how you should function as, as a nation under the kind of governance, the oppression of Rome. So the Pharisees were highly nationalistic. The Pharisees felt like we should, they should re, re, kind of back away from and fight the Romanization of Israel. The Sadducees were far more uh, in, inclined to say, hey, listen, this is where we are, and let's figure out how to get along with the Romans and figure out how to work. So there were political differences. These were the leaders of the nation, uh, and there was no separation of church and state, so they also led, this was a theocracy, right? So they, they often, they led the people in terms of their faith. And so one of these Pharisees, which means this was a person who had wealth, they had power, uh, they, they had a lot to lose by some of the things that Jesus was talking about. He invited Jesus over to, for dinner. And they're sitting at the table. And it says, now there was a woman in this city, a sinful woman in the city, who learned that he was at table and in the house of the Pharisee. So there's this woman that has a reputation. Everybody knows who she is, right? And you can imagine why they knew who she was. She was a prominent woman in this field. And, and everybody knew her. She had her own, like, oh, this woman is out there. Like, she is sinful, has no space in our religious culture. She is the bottom end of our culture. We don't, we don't want anybody to live like her, anybody look like her. She's a sinner, right? And that was based through the rubric of the law of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the temple. And so this woman finds out that Jesus is there. And for some crazy reason, she thinks, I should go and crash this party. So she shows up and she brings this alabaster flask of ointment and she stands behind him because remember Jesus at this time, there'd be a table, it'd be low and they'd all be reclined around the table. Jesus' feet would probably be behind him and he'd be sitting at the table. She comes up behind him and she is just weeping at his feet standing there. And she begins to bathe his feet with her tears. Her tears, just, she's just weeping, she's just crying. And then she starts to wipe his feet with her hair and then she starts to kiss the feet. This is nasty, nasty. This is gross. I mean, forget the fact that she had no business being there as a woman in this house, in the culture. She's already up into that. But then she comes and she sits down, this, this woman who has been with many men, who has a reputation, she sits down and she starts just crying on these dirty, dusty, dungy feet. Because Jesus wasn't wearing like, Really nice shoes, you know. I don't know if you were here for the 
for the conversation earlier, if you were paying attention to Aisha, who was our host, like she's wearing some, she's, her shoe game is top notch today. Like she's got the Adidas wedges going on. Like they're for real. I mean, if you want to know shoe game, you got to talk to Aisha. But I tell you, Jesus didn't have shoe game back then. Like he's wearing sandals, open feet, dust everywhere, dung everywhere, covered on his feet. And this woman muddies all that up with her tears, then takes her nasty hair all over. Imagine what that did to her hair. And it wasn't like she was like, well, I'll just go take a shower, a nice warm shower. So she's got all this is muck and mud and she's wiping it with her hair. And then she's like, oh, what have I done? And she starts, oh, she starts kissing his feet. Like, I was like, what is going on here? And Jesus is just like, well, this is fascinating. This is amazing. And then she starts like giving him a pedicure right there. She pulls out the ointment. She's massaging his feet. And Luke, the, 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 the gospel tells us that when the Pharisee who had invited him saw what was going on, he said to himself, and it was all over his face, right? Oh. Oh. He says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. He had it all figured out. He says, if this man were a prophet. And the irony is, Jesus is going to show to him the fact that because he's a true prophet is why. And because he knows this woman, and because he knows what sort of woman she is, why he lets her touch him. That this is exactly what the prophet should be doing. And there's something interesting about this story that Jesus is going to reveal to us. And, and I'm going to say this, and, and, and before you start writing me your email, hear me out, okay? Okay, just hear me out. And that is what we see here is that sinfulness is in the eye of the beholder. The way in which people, in this story in particular, Jesus and the Pharisee, whose name is Simon, we'll find out later, the way that Jesus and Simon see this woman and her sinfulness is all in the eye of the beholder. Because Simon, as a Pharisee, saw her and understood sin as look at all the stuff that she has done, look at all the things that she has that, that, that are against our law. She, she's a person of terrible reputation. And so she is, because of her sin, cursed by God, her lot in life she deserves, and she's getting her just punishment. That would have been his framework for seeing and understanding sinfulness. But Jesus, as we're going to see, sees something very different. Jesus' framework for sinfulness is that this is a woman who's been wounded. This is a woman who's been wounded by evil. This is a woman who has been part of and been the product of an unmerciful system that has cast her out and set her aside. And so these two men, they see sinfulness very differently. And so to help Simon understand, Jesus says to him, Simon, I've got something to say to you. Simon says, well, tell me, teacher. He says, okay, here's the deal. A little story for you. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor. One owed 500 days wages. Year and a half, 500 days wages. And the other owed 50. Simon's like, okay, I got it. Since they were unable to pay the debt, the creditor forgave both of them. Now, which of them will love him more, <laughs> right? Not a tough question, let's be honest. Simon says, well, I suppose the one whose larger debt was forgiven. Jesus says, that's right. You got it, Simon. You're with me. Way to go. And what Jesus is beginning to break down for Simon and what he wants Simon to understand here is that how you see yourself, Simon, is going to affect how you see other people. How you see me, Simon, how you see Jesus is going to be affected by how you see yourself. How you see this woman is going to be affected by how you see yourself. How you behave, how you love people is going to be understood by how you see yourself, right? He's saying how people see themselves affects how they see others, how they behave towards others. So in this story, this person knows, I owed a year and a half of wages. This person gave me much love is given. The other person, well, you know, I could have probably come back eventually. He says, no, Simon, I want you to understand this lesson. How you understand yourself is key to being able to interact and understand and behave towards other people. And then he turns to the woman, right? And he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Now, this is the most, this is the key question of the whole thing. Remember, we talked a couple weeks ago about the power of questions. Like, so Jesus asked this question, and at face value, you're like, this is a stupid question. Let's just be honest, right? Like, I mean, I know we're not supposed to say Jesus asked dumb questions, but if I'm there, 
right? And I'm a Pharisee. I'm like, well, that's a dumb question. I just watched her make a mess everywhere of your feet, embarrassing me, embarrassing you. Of course I see this woman. But what Jesus was getting at was, you don't see her, Simon. You don't see her because you don't see yourself. You don't understand yourself. You don't see yourself as having received forgiveness and grace. You see yourself as having earned it and you have all this wealth and power that you think are the blessing of God. And he's basically saying, sign, you don't see this woman, you only see her sin. And you only see her sin in the lens by which you think about sin. But Jesus says, I see it all differently. He says, and here's what I mean, Simon. When I entered the room, when I entered your house, you didn't give me water for my feet, but she bathed them with her tears. She wiped them up with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but she's not stopped kissing my feet since the time I entered. You didn't, you didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. So I tell you, now this is the key. Her many sins have been forgiven. Jesus doesn't mince words. Jesus doesn't say you haven't done anything wrong. Just nothing wrong has ever happened. No, no, no. He just sees it completely differently. He says, her sins are forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. See, he says, I can see by her actions that she knows that she's forgiven. But the one to whom little is forgiven, the person who thinks little is forgiven, they love little. Simon, this woman knows, she knows who, the way she sees herself is reflected in how she treats me. And the way you see yourself is reflected in how you treat me. And then I love what he says to the woman. He looks right at her and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, a lot of times we read this, that like in that moment, Jesus is forgiving her sins because she's come. But, but I just, if you take the story at somewhat face value, like she never asks Jesus for forgiveness. She never professes Jesus as any kind of like savior or Lord. She doesn't, I would doubt she has any concept of that. I think she probably heard some of Jesus's teachings, saw the value that Jesus gave to the dispossessed, the marginalized, and she believed to be true of her that she was worthy of God's love and grace and that she was actually forgiven just like these other sinners that Jesus hangs out with. And see, I believe forgiven was the truth that she dared to choose. And I've worded that kind of specifically because we use words like believe and faith and they've lost a bit of meaning. But I actually believe that this woman was able to come into this space that she was not invited, that she did not belong. And she came into that space with confidence because she dared to believe what was true about her, that she was loved and that she was forgiven. It was a statement of fact, not a statement of what is now because you've done this, but you are forgiven. And now you've made a choice to believe that and understand your worth and your value. It's quite fascinating that Jesus is walking around. We have this all the time in scripture. Jesus is telling people that their sins are forgiven. They've never asked for it. He hasn't died on a cross. He hasn't rose from the grave. None of that. But yet we say, oh, all these things are absolutely necessary for forgiveness. So I'm just pressing that presupposition a little bit for those of us that have been around for a long time. That Jesus is going around declaring forgiveness of sin because God understands. God understands us and loves us, and we live in that place of forgiveness. It's the kindness that brings us to repentance, which I think is the owning of, right? That I need forgiveness, that I need this wholeness. So when Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven, the others around the table, right? They look and they say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And this wasn't necessarily a statement of wonder. It was a statement of like, you gotta be kidding me. Who is this joker? But he looks at the woman and he says this, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> She's got to wonder, like, what? Okay, my faith. Well, what, what faith? What did I, what do I, what is it that she actually believes or holds true or sees without seeing, right? Faith. And what am I saved from? I think it's fascinating that what I, I, as I look at this and I really think about it and I try to erase some of the stuff that I hold so like dear from up, it's like Jesus is saying, you have chosen to believe what is true of you, that you are forgiven. And so you are now saved from this life of believing that you are not loved by God. You are saved from the wounds that happened to you. There's healing. You can replace the word saved with healing. You are healed. Your faith has healed you from these wounds the wounds that you have created in this world and the wounds that have, been hap that have happened to you. Now go whole. Go whole. I love that word, peace. You know I'm a peace guy. I love that. He says, go in peace. 
Faith was her path to peace. That was what she dared to choose. What she dared to choose to believe true of her was this beautiful gospel that we are loved, we are forgiven, that God is kind, that God is gracious, that God is longing deep for relationship with us, wanting to combat the lie that we aren't made in God's image, that we aren't like God. No, 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 I've come to show you this. And this empathy, right, that Jesus has for this woman, his ability to to see her fully is because he understood her story. He understood that this woman was more than behavior. She had a story, right? She had all of these things that happened to her. She had all of these experiences. She was more than the sum total of the laws that the leaders thought that she broke. She was more than the gossip. She was more than the, the judgment. She was a whole person who had a story. And this is, I believe, what the gospel calls us to. Those of us who have been given this great privilege of daring to believe that we are loved by God, that we are whole, that we are forgiven, that it is the kindness of God that leads us to a place of healing and repentance. And that transforms us. It has deep implications for your everyday peacemaking life. So right now it's 1146. Never tell people what time it is in church, by the way. Never do it. You all just looked at your watch and like, oh man, he's going to go forever. I just lost you. All right. So hang with me. All right. Where will you be tomorrow at 1146? Probably the most, one of the most important questions you could answer when you're at church. Where will I be tomorrow? Because right now is about 1146 tomorrow. Like what, what, what God wants to do in your life and my life through our time here today is about tomorrow. It's about our everyday life. So at 1146 tomorrow, you're going to be engaged with people all around you. And we're going to be tempted to judge people through that rubric of our experiences. We're going to be tempted to sit as Simon, to know this woman, to know her story, to know that she's a sinner. And we're going to be called by the Spirit of God to something better. How do we do that? Well, I think we can do just, we can listen to the whole story. Learn to ask those questions like we talked about. Find out how people grew up. Find out what their life was like. Tell me about your mom. Tell me about your dad. Do you have brothers and sisters? Did you go on vacation as a kid? Where did you go on vacation as a kid? What was kind of the favorite thing your family did? What was the hardest thing growing up? Where did you go to school? What did you study? What did you learn about God? All of these things factor in. What was the hardest thing you've ever been? What was the meanest thing anybody's ever said to you? What are the things that you still have a hard time dealing with? Now, that's probably not the first set of conversation questions at coffee with the new, you know, coworker. Right? Tell me your deepest, darkest fear and like what. But we engage, we get to know the whole story. And when we know the whole story, I think we can start to see emerge a really more powerful, helpful view of sin. That's not the judgmental, like you did this, you did this, and now I, as a, a religious leader, I get to tell you what you need to do so that you can be good with God and everything is good. No, we can recognize that sin is wounding. Sin is woundedness. It's far bigger than the, than the, the moralisms. Not, that's not to say that morality is not important, but, it's, but sin is far, far bigger. Paul talks about sin being this thing at work in the world that holds power and oppresses it's this, and I think we can reduce it to this big lie that we're not loved by God. Reduce it to this big lie that we're not, but we have to earn it somehow. And in that woundedness, we wound others. So when we start to hear stories, oh man, if we will listen, we can start to do something pretty cool. We can start to hate the wound, but love the wounded. Because let me talk to my like church folk. You're like me. Like you, you're for as long as you can remember, you've been a part of a community of faith, a church, right? Like I was, my dad was a pastor. I'm second generation in this line of work. Like my whole life was just in a church, right? So I'm a, I'm a churchman, right? Have you ever heard the statement, hate the sin, love the sinner? Anybody ever heard that? Raise your hand. I say, hate the sin, love the sinner. Okay, let me tell you something right now. I hate that statement with a passion. I hate it. it I, because it sounds so good, it feels right, but here's all it does is produce judgmental spirituality because we think that somehow we can then judge, oh, this is sin, this isn't sin. We can somehow parse that out and we still ascribe like hate the sin. We think about it as, well, hate what that person has done without any understanding of why they've done it, without any understanding of what's going on in their life. And we can't do it. It just creates this big old line. And so I, I just, I have, re- I have written in, deliver entire sermons on that, why that's such a bad idea. But, but what I think is powerful is we say, well, I hate the wound, but I love the wounded. 
I hate what wounds do to people. I hate what fear can do. I hate what greed can do. I hate what lust can do. Because wounded people wound people. This is the perpetuity of sin in our world. It just flows. And until we break that cycle with forgiveness, healing of the wound by the only one who can heal us, which is our creator, we just continue on down this road. But when we say, oh, I got to hate the wound, but I will love the wounded. I have, I, that will bring me to a space of understanding because I'm not defining a person by their moral decisions the sinner, hate the sin, love the sin. It's such a pejorative term, sinner, as if you're not. Give me a break. As if I'm not. And when we do that, then we can focus our eyes on their shoes, right? That's what we want to do. We can say, oh, I can focus the journey that they've been on. I can focus my eyes on those shoes, that journey. I wonder if like the woman was focused on Jesus' feet because of Jesus' journey, the feet that brought good news. I wonder, I don't know. But do we, can we then focus on people's journey, their story, their feet? And Jesus does this beautifully over and over again, but no place else is it so huge than when Jesus is hanging on the cross. So Jesus goes through this mockery of a trial. He's accused of treason. He's tried as a criminal of the state, accused of mounting an insurrection, king of the Jews. There's only one king, Caesar. Caesar is Lord. And as he hangs there, Romans and 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 Israelites and non-Israelites all watching this, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's knowing somebody's story. This Jesus who is the recipient of the violence is offering forgiveness because he knows their story. He knows the fear that's driving them. He knows the wound. And he came to fight the wound and he came to expose the wound for the lie that it was, but the wound is persistent. That's powerful. That's understanding the impact that trauma has in a person's life. And so Jesus seemed to me to practice trauma-informed spiritual care. If you're familiar with this emergence that's happened over the past two decades of care that is trauma-informed, that moves us from a fundamental question of what's wrong with me or if I'm the caregiver to think, well, what's wrong with this person? I need to fix that. I need to understand it. To a, a more formative question, more redemptive question of what happened to me? What happened to you? Because once we do that, once we dig into what has come in, I bring this assumption that God has made us. We're all beautifully, fearfully, wonderfully made. But then wounds happen. Sin happens. It persists. And that leads to more wounding. And so I got to break that cycle. And when we start to ask those kinds of questions, when we start to dig in, when we start to really listen, we will make the world a better place because we will learn and experience and give the healing power of solidarity, right? To stand in solidarity with someone like Jesus with this woman who understood her, exuded empathy, who knew that she was oppressed by a system that was unmerciful, a system that didn't take into account all the things that happened to her, a system that was very anti-God, because God understands everything that's happened to us. That's why God can love us so perfectly. And when Jesus comes and he stands in solidarity with her, right, he helps to, uh, to, to re- ease the weight of oppression, which is the same thing we do. When we stand in solidarity with people that are different than us and we hear their story and we have empathy for them, we stand with them, we ease the burden of oppression. And the great oppressor, this, this great theme that we have all throughout scripture, the great oppressor is sin and death. It's the wounds and the wounding. And Jesus came as one who knew no sin and stood in complete solidarity with all of us who did. All the wounds that we've created. Uh, Pope John Paul II wrote a, uh, a, an article, right? Or a catechism, which <laughs> if you're the fancy word catechism, blog post, right? It, And he wrote this beautiful uh, catechism called Jesus, a man in solidarity with all humanity, all humanity. And I'm going to do something you should never do in a talk like this. I'm going to read a a big chunk out of it and bore you to death. Okay. So just hang in there with me. All right. Read along. Just we'll go slow. Just pause because it's so beautiful because it shows us this was the very heart of Jesus. This is the gospel to be in solidarity with one another, to understand, which then allows us to love even when we don't agree with what people have done or believe, but we can understand it and have the empathy. So this is what Pope John Paul II wrote. He said, Jesus worked in the spirit 
of a great love for every human person. In other words, what motivated Jesus was this intense love for everybody, everybody. And he did this on the basis of the profound solidarity which he had for those created in the image and likeness of God. Every person created in the image of likeness of God, so that was the motivation. So what does this solidarity consist of what? Like, what's the big heartbeat of it? It's the manifestation of the love which has its source in God himself. Right? The, the, the manifestation, the visible expression of ultimate perfect love is this act of solidarity by Jesus to come alongside those of us made in the image of God. He writes, the Son of God came into the world to reveal this love, to show this love. This is what it means to love. And he already revealed it by the fact that he himself became man, one of us. So the very taking on of flesh, right, why the manger is so powerful, is because that is the ultimate greatest expression and manifestation of love, that God would stand in solidarity with those of us who wound, that God would experience the wounding that we experience. This union with us on the part of Jesus Christ, true man, is the fundamental expression of his solidarity with every human person. It speaks eloquently of the love with which God himself has loved each and every person. Each and every person, regardless of politics, gender, age, race, zip code, religion, sexuality, anything that we could use to divide humanity, this love unites it. This love brings together and starts to heal all those wounds. Jesus is the man, a true man, who like us in all things but sin. Think of it like this, who like us in all things but never wounded anyone, never wounded anyone, became a victim for sin, became a victim of those wounds and entered into solidarity with all, even to death on a cross. That's how much of a victim he became to show us we can break this. And it's done through forgiving one another and transforming us. It transforms us. So we've gone through four weeks of listening. We live in a climate that is so hard to bring human dignity to a person who could believe and say and do things that we couldn't imagine how. But yet the cross we bear, if we're following Jesus, is to give what Jesus gave, this kind of love this kind of empathy, this kind of understanding. So as we get ready to have communion together, what is it that God is inviting you into today? Maybe it's something that stuck with you over the past few weeks. Maybe it was something in a song that just hit your heart and you just feel God inviting you into some experience. I would hope that all of us know that God is inviting each and every one of us all over the planet to live in the truth that we're forgiven and that our lives would then reflect that truth just like this woman so maybe you're here today and you've been coming for a while a long time maybe it's your first time whatever and you're wondering what is it all about well i think ultimately this idea and this this big concept of faith in christianity is about choosing to believe what is true about you by the grace of god that you are loved that you are whole that you are forgiven that you are a wreck that you wound people and you have been wounded and the creator of the universe, that which is love is flowing through you wanting to begin a healing process and has called you and is calling you into becoming a healer of this world. We call it peacemaking. That's the invitation. And so maybe for the first time, you just need to surrender to that truth as hard as it is to believe that you are forgiven, that you are loved and allow it to transform you and shape you, allow love to flow through you. Maybe for all of us, we're being invited at this moment in time with communion to take the bread and the juice, to drink it, to eat it, as a reminder of our commitment to stand in solidarity with those that have been wounded by sin, just as Jesus stood in solidarity with us. Because we were wounded by sin. So as you came in, you probably saw these little, uh, communion to go uh, containers. If you didn't, I think we have a few of our um, hospitality folks that have a basket and they'll bring one by if you want to slip up your hand. Everybody's invited, by the way. This is not our table. This is the table of Jesus. Uh, and, and I am not in charge of the guest list. <laughs> no, thank you. We're all invited. These are symbols. They represent the body of Christ 
that was given to every person as a reminder of the call to forgiveness, to nonviolence, to love. The juice is a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed in his resistance of the temptation to wound, to lash out at those who would want to continue to perpetrate evil. He just absorbed it and released it as love. That's what it means to carry our cross. And this is an invitation to remember that. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a song for us to just contemplate this idea of God's invitation. And, uh, and then we'll have communion together. So during this song, I'd encourage you to open and pull the bread out. Pull the bread out first um, and then flip it over and you can open up for the juice. And then I'll come back out after this song and we'll pray together. And we'll take these as a reminder of God's love for all of humanity, the solidarity expressed in Jesus. These are symbols that remind us that the only way to love this way, the only way to forgive, the only way to have empathy, this type of empathy is through the spirit of Christ at work in us and in our world. And so we use this metaphor of being nourished by the body of Christ and the blood of Christ because it is that reality that it nourishes us spiritually. It offers us hope and strength It offers us the ability to receive the pain, to receive the wound, to receive the violence, and to return it as grace and forgiveness, just as Jesus did on the cross. And I think that's why the wisdom of scripture teaches us to do this regularly, to come together, to share a meal. We don't share meals like they would have in early uh, days of this movement, but to have this still reminder that what nourishes us is this, and it's expressed in community together, whether we're online or on campus. And so if you haven't yet, the body of Christ broken for you and every human being who has ever lived and will ever live on this planet, take and eat.
and the blood of Christ, which was shed for every human being, every person that will ever live, that has ever lived, because that's just how good the grace of God is. And it was shed for us as a reminder that the only way to cease the cycle of violence and wounding is to not return a wound for a wound. And so we are nourished by this hope of the Christ in us. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. And now, Lord, we finish our time together with a reflection and a song that reminds us of the reckless love that you demonstrate to us that we then can demonstrate to our world. Amen. Would you stand with us for this last song together?
We're going to go over to Aisha. She has a few things for us. Thank you. Wasn't that incredible, amazing worship? Well, you know, part of our weekly experience here at Crossroads is to give and support our church. We're so grateful for your giving. And this is how our ministry is propelled forward, and we believe that we grow our generosity through giving. I know when I give, I count it all joy. There are a couple different ways that you can give right now or throughout the week. You can go online. You can also text the word CROSSROADS to 77977. And guys, you can Venmo. I mean, come on, how hip are we? I just joined Venmo last week. You can Venmo us by searching the email Venmo at CrossroadsColorado.com. If you're in the room, you can drop your offering envelope right into that orange kiosk. It's also a paid postage envelope, so you can put pop it in the mail. And if you'd like prayer, we would love to connect with you. You can share a prayer request right on your comment card, whether it's paper paper or digital. And you can text the word prayer to 970-500-0970. If you're in the room, you'll find a prayer team member to the left of the stage here. And if you're participating in the live cast at crossroadscolorado.com, just hit that live prayer button and someone will be with you. Now, remember, guys, next week is football Sunday. Whoop, whoop. So come in your football attire. And please remember, on February 4th, there is no Thursday in-person or live cast service. So we'll see you Sunday. Take care. Have a safe week. Bye.